Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all out there in the universe of the internet. We're happy that you've joined us again. Uh, at the end of the last session, I did forget in my enthusiasm to pray to wrap up our session from week four. And we are currently uh, beginning week five of The Power of Knowing God. And I'd just like to read you the wrap-up session because it's beautiful. Aren't you awed with God, stunned by all you are learning for yourself about him? It makes such a difference when you allow God to speak for himself, when you listen to his word directly rather than to the opinions of others. It helps you to know what God says so you can measure what man says against the plumb line of his word. The question then becomes, who will you believe? What will direct and order your life, your thinking, your behavior, your attitude? You've looked at enough verses from various books of the Bible to see that God is righteous and just in all his ways. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Therefore, all that our sovereign God does is just and right. Loving kindness and truth go before him. If you will get to know his word and watch God in action and genuinely listen to what he says, then you will know right from wrong, truth from lies, and know how you are to live. You will gain strength and courage, courage to trust God, to obey him no matter the circumstances. And with that will come an inner peace so that you cannot find any place else. It's found solely in knowing God, in the insurance of his absolute veracity and his immutability. Because the Lord God will never change, you can stake everything on him. But you may ask, how does God feel about me? Because he is omnipresent and omniscient, I know he knows all about me. Will this make a difference in the way he treats me? Remember his loving kindness, his grace, his favor is always making the way, going before you. That is what we will explore in our next lesson, which is the one we're going to look at today, a lesson you won't want to miss. Why don't you make it a point each day to thank God for one thing you have learned about him in these lessons? Just you might even want to keep a journal, even recording just a line or two each day about how these truths of God are shaping your decisions, direction, relationships, and well-being. That's a good plan. Now we're starting into week five. So we've learned a lot, much about the character of God and the ways of God in the past for lessons. We've seen that he's self-existent self-sufficient creator. He is the righteous, just, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present sovereign who rules over all, a God of truth who never changes. As we've delved into his word, we've also caught a glimpse of his wrath, an aspect of God that many dislike and others doubt. In light of this, we want to know whether this great and awesome sovereign loves us. And if not, how can we get him to love us, especially when he knows the truth of what we're like? In this lesson, we will explore what God tells us of his love. Get prepared to experience his character in a way that should capture your heart. In fact, why don't you pause as a group? We will. And we'll ask God to reveal himself to us, to show each of us where we stand with him. We'll do that. First of all, I'm going to bring my sister in, Adrienne, and uh, as you see, she's looking quite fit <laughs> and healthy, but she's not feeling fit and healthy. So uh, welcome to the session here, Adrienne. I know she might have herself uh, muted because of uh, having a cold. You can unmute yourself anytime, Rennie. Anyway, we are going to be observing today, and uh, before we do that, I'm going to open in prayer. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you teach us about yourself through your word. You prove yourself trustworthy, 
and you prove yourself worthy of worship. As we come to know you better, Lord, uh, cause us to rely on you more and help us to not doubt any longer because you are the God of truth and you abide forever and your word abides forever as well. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. I'm glad that you're going to show us this morning how much you do. And uh, we are looking forward to what you're going to teach us. So reveal yourself to us, Lord, and show each of us where we stand with you. And if there are any who do not have a relationship with you, Lord, I just pray that you would call them, that you would uh, show them how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to whip over to the next, which is our screen share. Are you there, Ren? <laughs> I'm going to do something. I'm just going to pause a minute. Oh my goodness, that took a little while to figure out. <laughs> hey, we're matching again today. Look at us. We're sisters. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Okay, I'm just going to read what's in our text here uh, on the observe spot. It says, those who haven't studied the full word of God for themselves often think that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament seems to them an angry, wrathful deity who, some who is somehow tempered by the time of Jesus so that he becomes more compassionate and loving. By now, you know that that cannot be true because you have seen that God is, what is that word, Adrian? Immutable. Immutable. He does not change. So let's see for ourselves what place love has in the nature of God, starting with an encounter between God and Moses, in which the Lord answered Moses' request to show me your glory, as in Exodus 33, verse 18. I'm going to turn the page over. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> All right. I'm just going to adjust this camera here a little bit. Hang on a second. Uh, this one here. Oh, I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go over to here, and I'm going to make this just slightly zoomed in for the readers online. Okay, so we're going to read <clears throat> Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. We're going to mark all references to the Lord and as we have before with the triangle and every occurrence of the word loving kindness with a heart. Are you ready? Oops, I lost your camera again there, Ren. Nope, oh, hang on a second, I'm going to pause. There she was, and there she was, gone. <laughs> okay, can you read for us Exodus 34, 6 to 7? Then the Lord promised by... Oh, the Lord. Pa Lord passed by in front. Oh, yeah, okay. Lord. Passed by in front of him, who is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord... The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to compassionate and gracious. Yep, showing oh, gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fa of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Very good. That's a little blurry on my copy, but we are going to now read, get you to read the insight box. Loving kindness, the translation of the Hebrew word hesed, speaks of grace and favor. Hesed is used often 
in respect to the covenant relationship between God and Israel. Good. Very good. So how is God described in these verses? So let's let's number them off as we go. Compassionate, gracious, mm-hmm. slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. That's four for me. Uh, I think that's it. Forgives iniquity. Mm-hmm. He keeps loving kindness for thousands. So it's, it's yeah, uh, yeah. So he keeps. I'm going to put five as he keeps it. Okay. And who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin? Mm-hmm. And, and yet, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. Seven. And what else? Visiting the iniquity of fathers and the children and all the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. That's a long time. So what did we learn about marking loving kindness? We learned it about God. Yes. So he abounds in it, right? Yes. That's what our text says. And I'm sorry, I forgot to turn the volume on my phone down and it did happen to uh, (laughs) pop open. Okay, so good. So the next thing we are going to observe is uh, in the next verses, we read what Moses said to the children of Israel as they were ready, getting ready to go into the land God had promised them as an everlasting possession. By the way, they had just finished wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they wouldn't trust God, even after he had redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt. So, wow. That, uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, my phone is going off on me and I don't want it to. Sorry. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to read now Deuteronomy 7, uh, verses 6 to 10. I've got too much on my desk here. Mm-mm-mm. Deuteronomy 7, uh, 6 to 10, and we're going to mark the Lord, and we're going to mark loving kindness as we did. All right. Oh, poor Adrian. I just love it how we wake up in the morning in different towns and we put on the same color shirts. (laughs) Poor girl. Okay. For you are a holy people to the Lord. Your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he he swore to your forefathers the lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of pharaoh king of egypt now there know therefore that the lord your god he is God the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation which with those who love him and keep his commandments but repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them he will not delay with him who hates him he will repay him to his face 
Boy, oh boy, oh boy, here we are. It, as we are recording this, it is um, Monday, November the 13th, 2023, and a lot has happened in our world, uh, and this is what we are reading today. And so I'm just going to say to all the people out there, uh, we talked about trusting God and trusting his word, and uh, this is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> One thing I learned in studying precept upon precept is that when we when we uh, study God's word, we must be humble and be prepared to change our minds when our minds disagree with God's word. Right? Okay, so back we go. What did we learn about uh, from marking loving love and loving kindness? So the first time we see it is in verse seven, and that's why that's why we find do this marking very easily. We can go, oh, where is it? There it is. That's where I marked it. So why did God love? Has God loved the people of e Israel? Well, there's a negative in there. Was it because they were more in number? No. Uh, why? And so what does he say? No, because you were the fewest of all people. Okay, so God did not love Israel, the people of Israel, because they were a mighty great nation, but because they were few. And not because, well, no, because he didn't love them because they were few. He loved them. Why? In verse eight. Be, uh, because he had an oath with his forefathers, with their yes, forefathers. Because he made a promise. He made an oath. He made a covenant. And he, because of that oath, what did he do? Brought them out of Egypt. Yes, and redeemed them from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh the king. Right, what, what else do we see about God's love here? Verse 9, as we come down and we find the heart marking. He keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth, thousandth generation. And who is it to? Those who keep his commandments. Those who love him and keep his commandments. Good. So, um, the contrast being made between verses 9 and 10. So, he, he, he loves those who love him and keep his commandments. And I'm going to mark the contrast with a joining mark like that. And then I put a kind of a Z through that so that, so that I know that that's not a comparison. It's a contrast because it's broken up. So the contrast that we see is he's faithful and he keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love him. And then the word of contrast is the word but. And what does the but say? Oh yeah, but repays those who hate him. Yes, to their faces, to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Is this fair? I would say so. On what basis? Nothing God does is not fair. <laughs> and just. Yes. So he, so he, he, uh, he chose a people because he did. And he gave them commandments and he made a covenant. And so because he is God, he keeps his covenant. All right. Very good. So how, the question is, how did the truth in this passage line up with what you've learned about God in the previous four sessions? It just solidifies. Yes. It just for solidifies the, it. Yeah. And for More. the people. Oh, mm -hmm. So they line up that God is omniscient. He's omnipotent. 
He chooses who he wants. People can think it's fair or not fair. I mean, when we grow up in families, right? <laughs> we can say, oh, the baby of the family gets everything. They never had to do this, that, and the other thing, right? Or, or they can say, oh, um, you're the one with all the, you're the one that's all the smart one or the talented one or the gifted one, right? And we, that's not fair, but God is always fair. Okay, so we're going to look some more now. Observe, we've seen God's declaration of his love for Israel. How long will it last? These are obstinate and rebellious people, a fact you will see for yourself when you read through the Old Testament. Casting no aspersions on any particular person, <laughs> but we do see what we see in the Old Testament. The following verses speak of Israel's restoration after judgment for their sins. So we're looking in Jeremiah 31 verses 1 to 3, and we're going to circle uh, the families, the people of Israel, triangle around the Lord and heart again under loving kindness. You ready to go? No, I am. Okay, good. <laughs> I can't stop this coughing. I'm so sorry. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. Oh, families of Israel, isn't that? Okay, so I'm going to circle that. And they... Shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. So I'm going Israel. to say, I'm going to put the people. Okay. Okay. Israel. Yeah. When it went to find its rest. I'm not sure. The Lord. Can. Okay. So the Lord. Appeared to him, Israel. Okay, so that's okay. So they give, they've just provided that little bit of context for us. Yeah. Well, for me, that helps. Yeah. From afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Oh, loved, love, loved. Sorry. Loved. With an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you. With loving kindness. Okay. Hearts and circles there. All right. So what do we learn about God's relationship? We didn't do Micah yet. Oh, do we? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, Micah. Sorry. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession he does not retain his anger forever but he because he delights in unchanging love okay so hang on the remnant of his possession i'm going to put a circle around that okay that's people so all right so what do we learn about god's relationship with his chosen people Well, we go down in where Jeremiah 31, we go down where we mark loved. He loves them with an everlasting love. So everlasting is forever. forever. Right? Mm -hmm. And what, and what else about him? It's not just that he loves them, but he's drawn them with loving kindness. Yes. Then Micah says, what is it? What is God's? Pardons iniquity. Yes. So some gods are very wrathful and uh, they just zap you and throw you in the trash, but not, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, do monstrous things to them. Okay. So what about him being angry? He does not retain his anger forever. And there's a reason for that. Because he delights in unchanging love. Yes. So his anger does not last forever. That's contrast there. And the contrast 
um, yeah, in between the Jeremiah was the everlasting love and the anger does not last forever. So that's a wonderful contrast that we have learned. Okay, so we're going to look at some New Testament passages that further reveal the nature of God's love. We're going to look at 1 John 4, 9 to 10, verse 16, verse 19, and then John 3, 16 and 17, then 35 and 36. And we're going to mark God. We're going to mark the Son, Jesus Christ, with a cross. We're going to mark love the same. And when we see the word wrath, we're going to mark it with a W. Are you ready? Uh-huh. Okay. By this love. The love. This the love. Sorry. Of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's the son. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, verse 16 and 19. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God, whoops, God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. We love because he first loved us. Hmm. Okay, going on, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him and that's the shall sign. not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Son. The Father loves the Son. Oh, yeah, that jumped to 35. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Sorry. Yeah. And all things, and has given all things into his. The sun. Yeah. Do we have to turn the page? That's three, yes. Three, three, six. He. Oh, oh, watch who you read. Hold on. He, read the phrase. Okay, never mind. I yep. know what it is now. He who believes in the sun mm -hmm. has eternal life, but he who does not obey the sun will not see life. But the wrath. Big W. Of God abides on him. Okay, so back we go with the questions. So um, so what did we learn? What was the overwhelming thing that we learned about God here? The Father. That God loves us and sent his son to die for us. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the very uh, immutable character of God is, it says love. right at the end of verse uh, 16, God is love. Yes. yes. Right. And uh, what, uh, what do we learn then about our relationship with that in verse 19? We love because he first loved us. Yes. We don't, it's not that we love God, but that God loved us. And we love because he first loved us. So in other words, God is creator and he created us. <laughs> He's not spiteful. He didn't make us so that he could poke us like Mr. Bill. <laughs> no, he created us. And he went, wow, I just love that. <laughs> right? When God made everything, he said that about human beings. That's very good. Very good. I love that. 
All right. He, and we love because we were created in his image. And we love because he first loved us. And he showed us his love. How? By sending verse, his son. Yes, in verse uh, 9 and 10. All right. So, um, so what did we learn about marking the sun? There's a lot of different things that we learned along the way. Who is, who is the sun? God. He's the only begotten. Yeah. Right. And he was sent into the world. Why? That those who believe in him will not perish. Yes, that we might live through him. Good. And what else is the son? He, he was sent as the, that nice word. Propitiation. Yeah, propitiation for our sins. The payment, the just payment, paid in full. All right, good. Uh, all right. Perish with heaven. Okay, so did Jesus come into the world, the Son come into the world to judge us? Oh, my goodness. He no. came to, be sa to save us. And, um, all right. So what happens to those? Well, hey, go, let's go back. So according to these verses, how can we know God loves us? Because he sent his son to die for us. Yes. Greater love hath no man than this, than he die, lay down his life for his friends, it says, uh, says elsewhere. Okay. So what happens to those who do not believe? Oh, let's say, what does it say? What happens to those who do not obey him, who do not believe that he is the son of God, who died so that we would not perish? We'll face God's wrath. Yes. He who believes in the son has eternal life. So there's that contrast word, right? But we always watch out for those. So I'm going to mark that contrast the way I do. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's pretty serious. That's pretty serious. In in the world that I and the and the groups that I move and live and interact with, there's a lot of people who who think that they are going to ascend and that's what they think. They think they're going to ascend. The Bible does not teach us that. The Bible teaches us that if you do not believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. That, to me, is very, very sad. So the last question here, is it fair of God to do this? I think so. And, and I know that's a short answer, Adrian. <laughs> I know, but I'm really not feeling well. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll carry on. So if God, if God made every way, every way for us to, to uh, escape his wrath, and it's very simple. It's so simple. It's so simple. Even a child can understand it. Would you not say? He, God has made it so simple. And yet the problem is, is that people don't want simple. They want to be able to jump through hoops and prove themselves. And that's not what God requires at all. Okay. Now we're going to observe. I agree. I think it's mighty fair of God to do it that way. Okay. Those who don't know or study the word of God believe that God cannot love them until they straighten their lives out until they get themselves cleaned up, so to speak. Let's see what God says. So we're going to read Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, and Romans 5, verses 6 to 10 aloud. Now, we're not taking these verses out of context for this study. We're just taking the topic and putting them together so that you can we can see. All right, so here you go. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. And we're going to mark everything. God 
uh, people. We're going to circle whoever they are and Christ and wrath with a W, just the same we did before. But God, being rich in mercy because of his oh, great love with which he loved, he loved us. Oh, just wait a minute. Are we going to mark us? It says certain no, every reference people. to people, however they are described, including okay. pronouns. Okay. Okay. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, transgressions made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Good. All right. So let's go on to Romans 5, verses 6 to 10. <coughs> Excuse me. For while we, we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, I'm going to circle that, ungodly. For one will hardly hmm. die for... I'm confused. Okay. Okay. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. I'm going to put righteous man. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to just put man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. Well, but we could God, have done one and we could have done someone, but I'm not doing that. Okay. But God demonstrates his God demonstrates own love toward us. Us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his. That's Jesus. Blood, we shall be saved through though from the wrath of God through him. That's Jesus. Yeah. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, his... I'm just going to put Jesus, yeah. Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's Jesus' life. Okay, do we have one anymore? No, okay. Oh. No. Okay. Six to ten. So uh, what did God and Jesus do to show their love for us? Okay, so let's go back to Ephesians uh, 2 passage. So there's an even when we were dead in our transgressions, what did he do? Made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. That was because God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved with us. So he made us alive. And then Roman in Romans 5, <clears throat> 6 to 10, it explains it a little bit better. What was the timing? Okay, so just wait. So that when is a time word. So I'm going to put, a, as we do, you're not look, seeing it. I'm going to put my little clock there. It's ringing. Even when. And then there's another time here. While we were still helpless. At the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. So then it says, what did God and Jesus do to show their love for us? Well, it shows us in verse 8. Christ died for us. Yes, even while we were yet sinners. So while is the time. Time. I'm not going to mark it that. I mark that. What was our condition when God did this? We were sinners. Yes. 
So what does this reveal about God? God has unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Does he, does he expect us to uh, get our lives in order, get straightened out, get scrubbed up and clean and then come to him? No. Well, what's the deal then? We don't have to do that, right? Because already no. he's already made the way. He's already made the way. So God's love is kind of preemptive in the sense that he doesn't he doesn't expect us to clean him ourselves up. That's why he sent Christ. Right. All right. That's what it says here in the scripture. So that is a wonderful thing. All right. Now we're going to go over to the next page and we're on page 84 now in the power of knowing God. And, um, we're looking at Romans eight, 31 and 32, verse 35, 37 to 39. Sometimes when Christians undergo trials and hardships or things don't go well, they think God doesn't love them. Is this true? Can those who believe in Jesus, those who receive him as their Lord and God, expect life to be free of trouble? Well, you got a nasty cold, and I have been sick for a month. So <laughs> yeah, if we believed that way, we'd be in trouble. But we're going to see what it says in, in uh, Romans. And we're going to mark God and Jesus and God's son and believers. So we're going to circle that and we're going to include the pronouns we and us and love or loved. Okay. All right. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Good question. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Well, I was going to circle us all. Yes. How will he, God, okay, not also with him, Jesus, freely give us all things who will separate us from the love of Christ will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword now we're going into 37 but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Well, are we going to mark that Jesus or? I'm going to put this God. Okay. For I am, I am convinced. I'm going to circle I because that's a. That neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yes. Good. <coughs> so the, what, what are we learning about what we, um, about the, those who are, those who belong to Christ? Okay, so the first thing, the major thing, back in verse 31. Terrible to have such a bad cold. Okay. okay. Yeah. Back in uh, 31. 31. Why does it say what you were 
this is a really super statement that uh, that is worthy of, uh, you know, tattooing on the inside of your eyelids <laughs> backwards so that you can see it, right? <sighs> what is the main thing here? If God is for us, who can be against us? Entirely, right? That that That's huge. I'm going to put stars around that too. If God is for us, who can be against us? <clears throat> um, those who belong to Christ. Uh, how about we go in um, uh, verse 32 here? What does this indicate? Just read 32. Uh, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So let's put that in ha um, references to those who belong to God, belong to Christ. It's, a, it's stated as a rhetorical question. How would we put that as a peg that would... Um, indicate how much we're loved you want some help yeah <laughs> well okay so the statement is made so if if god delivered his own son over for us why would we think that there that he's not going to provide for us everything else? God proved himself by giving Christ to us to make the propitiation for our sin, to make the way so we can have a relationship with God. And and because of that, he's going to give us everything that we need. All things. Right? Then there's the great, this, I mean, this, I, I memorized this. I don't have it entirely correctly, but I did memorize this passage. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, so look at all the things, all the things that could separate us, that people could think. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. In all of those things, okay, so all of those things that are persecution, the terrible things that can happen to humanity, because of uh, other people. And then there's that nice, in verse 37, that connecting word, but. Okay, so the, that is a, when you see but, it's a contrast. So all the terrible things that happen to us, nakedness, fire, sword, distress, persecution, famine. But what is the thing that's going on for the believer? We conquer through him who loved us. And how do we conquer? Overwhelmingly. Yes. Yes. So, um, so the question here is what is what holds true for all believers, no matter their circumstances. So let's see the, the circumstances that are outlined in verse 38. It's just like a, um, oops, sorry. Okay. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, not, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Nothing. Separated from the love of God. Yeah, and there's that Jana Alaira song that I was teaching kids and they love it. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, 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 absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how would knowing the truths of these verses help you in dis difficulties? Okay, you have this terrible cold. You have not been feeling well. I have not been feeling well at all for a month. <clears throat> How does knowing these things help us? God loves me no matter what. So All of those things cannot separate us from the love of God, mm -hmm. which is in Christ Jesus. And if today someone came banging on your door, tromping up the stairs, dragged you away, took all your stuff, <laughs> burned your house down, would that separate you from the love of God? 
<laughs> Sorry, Adrian. And the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> no. It might not see, seem very loving or kind, but it doesn't mean that you're separated from God's love. All right, we're going to read 1 John 5, 2 and 3, and John 13, 34 and 35, and we're going to circle we and you, and we're going to draw a heart over love and loved, because we're going to learn about our responsibility in this. Okay, so 1 John 5, 2 to 3. What are we doing? We, you, and heart. Okay. Yeah. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love, we, sorry, love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep, we, sorry, keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Mm, okay, so we've got to turn over and we're going to do uh, John 13, 34, 35. The new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love. Oh, sorry, love I didn't circle them. That you, one another. Okay, one another. I'm going to circle one another. Oh, okay. and one another. Okay. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So, uh, so what's our responsibility? Because we are loved by God, what's about our, what's our responsibility? To love one another. Yes, and to? Keep his commandments. Yes. Uh, his commandments are not burdensome. Um, there were ten big ones. But now Jesus is giving a new command, and that is? Love one another. Yes. Oh, I forgot to serve the circle, the one another, one another. <clears throat> one another he's talking about here who is he talking to i think it's who the, is the jews we? originally pardon me i think it's the jews originally yeah but who is he speaking to this is first john right so this is uh after jesus death and res resurrection and ascension by this we know that we love who the children of God. Yes. So the children of God. And so his commandments are not burdensome. And then back here, who's Jesus is talking to his followers. Okay. Right. So we should be loving Jesus followers. Doesn't mean we don't love everybody else too, but we will be known by the way we look out for each other. Sadly in our world, uh, we have become a culture in in uh, Western culture that each is looking out for their own gain more than each other. And while I have been sick, I must say that I have certainly seen uh, practical examples of people who love other believers by the things that my friends, my believing friends did for me. And, uh, it's been very wonderful, and I appreciate it, and I bless God for them. And I hope they receive a blessing in return because of how they have been kind to me. All right, 1 John 3, uh, 14 through 19, and this is going over two pages, and we are just about done. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to observe, is love more than just a word you say to another? How does love look like? In what does yeah, how does love look in human flesh? So we're going to read first John 3 14 through 19 and circling people, we us. Uh, we're going to mark heart and we're going to mark truth in the same way as we have before. Are you ready? Okay. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love. The brethren. Oh, wait a minute. Do we mark them? Yes. We're both in love and heart. Okay. 
He, okay, wait a minute. Who, he who does not love abides in death. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not marking the he there. Yeah, Maybe I, I should. Know. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. <clears throat> All right. Everyone who hates his. His, I'm going to do his brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a murderer. And you know that, and you, sorry. Yep. Know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Oh, dear Lord. That just brings uh, recent events to very sharp contrast. We no know. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay. We, we know love. By this, that he laid down his life for us. Oh, is that true? Ought, okay, so he laid down his life for us. And, and we, we ought to lay down our lives, our, our lives for the brethren. Okay. <clears throat> but whoever has the world's goods and oh, sees. Oh, whoever. Whoever is a who, whoever. Sees his brother his bro in need. Mm -hmm. And closes his Heart, heart i'm doing that against him against him how does the love of god abide in him mm. little children I'm just... let us not love with word or with tongue but in deed and truth we will know this know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. Mm, so what do we learn about marking references to people? Well, I see a bunch of contrasts here. <clears throat> They're not necessarily joined by the word but, but in uh, verses, verse 14, we have the contrast between we who have passed out of death into life, and that's shown by the way we love the brother, but he who does not love abides in death. So I'm going to mark that as a contrast right there. <clears throat> Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay, so that's a that's an obvious contrast. That's an obvious a point of discernment. Discernment. All right. We know love how. That Christ laid down his life for us. And then this is a comparison. Because it's joined by the word and. So, and we ought to lay, so that was the example of Christ and that should be the example of us. Now there's a but. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And that's a big contrast. So, what shows that we love? Our deeds and the truth. Mm hmm So, there is, there's another contrast in this verse 18. And I'm going to mark it, and then you can tell me what the contrast is. That we shouldn't be with word or tongue, with tongue, but in truth and deed. Yes, so... So there's a lot of people who talk, 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 but they're not doing what they say. They talk a big game. All right. So <clears throat> we've already talked about the passage revealing the, about the one who hates his brother. That's very strong words to call that, <clears throat> excuse me, that person a murderer. You know, and uh, I hate to say this, but I have felt this, and God forbid that I have made anyone else feel like that, <clears throat> that there have been people in that, that were in the body of Christ 
calling themselves believers, and I don't have no reason to doubt that they were. <clears throat> but the way they treated me was the sword of the devil, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for, for all the good. Oh, your camera's frozen. Anyway, so how exactly should we show love to others according to verses 17 and 18? Um, and uh, 17 and 18. If we're of the truth, then, oh, I forgot to mark that truth. Look, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. Don't just blah, blah, blah. Say you're going to do this, going to do that, blah, blah, blah but in deed and in truth. I'm going to put Adrian out of the room here momentarily, and she can come back in again. <laughs> Her camera froze. All right. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians. There she is. There you are. Sorry, you froze. Yeah, I know. I don't know why. I don't either. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. And we're going to uh, underline every word or phrase that describes love. Okay, okay, so 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. Love is patient. Patient. Love is kind. Not jealous. I'm going to put the not sign through the not. <laughs> Love does not brag and is not arrogant. There's a lot does of knots not here. Act unbecoming. It does not seek its own, its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Mm. does not rejoice in unrighteousness there's a contrast but rejoices in the truth with the truth bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things love never fails love never fails According to these verses in 1 Corinthians 13, how do we show love in deed and truth? Well, there's a lot of knots. So let's do the positive things. <clears throat> Patient, kind, uh, rejoices in the truth, bears all things. Believes all things, mm -hmm. hopes all things, endures all things, and it never fails. Well, I can think of many instances in my life when uh, those things, uh, some of these things have not been true. Um, and that is not, <clears throat> yeah, so... Though of those, there's a few things in here, you know, that uh, I have repented of and I need to, we need to constantly be repenting when we find ourselves <clears throat> being an obvious contrast to what God's word teaches about love. So let's, let's get practical. So rejoicing in unrighteousness, well, how would that show up? And rejoicing in truth. So being happy. Yahoo! Wahoo! When the tr uh, in truthfulness. What is bearing all things? Bearing all things. I don't well, know. I'm. Oh well, I'm thinking. You, you haven't been a mother. <laughs> I'm. I. I am a mother, and uh, now I see how my mother, our mother, has bared a lot of things, borne a lot of things. Right? B o r n e. Put up with a lot of baloney. 
<laughs> right? There's a lot of baloney we have to put up with be when we love people. Doesn't mean we agree with it. We just bear with it because we understand that, you know, well, in, in the case of being a mother, you understand the person's young and immature. They don't know any better. <clears throat> they haven't learned how to control themselves. Believes all things. What is that? What do you suppose? This is something I have to uh, continually uh, repent of the wrong attitude, believing all things. It doesn't, does it mean, it doesn't mean that you're going to believe when people are telling you lies, right? Right. I think it, uh, you want to believe the best about people. You want to believe, I want to believe that people are really doing their best, that they're really trying their best, that they really have a right heart in them. I believe that they are always redeemable as long as they're breathing. That if they're if they're doing horrible or sinful things, that we, they believe that to believe to love is to believe that God can rescue them and will. Hope then that kind of goes with hopes all things, right? Hoping for the best for people. Enduring all things. That means when crappy stuff happens, we have our hope is not in this world. Our hope is secure in heaven because uh, Christ made the propitiation for us and we can hope. We have a blessed hope. And we know that God's love for us never fails. And when we don't have enough love, that our that we can ask him <laughs> to give us more love, which will never fail because it's his love, not our own. So anyway, we've come to that. So it says, think about the truths about the love of God that we've seen in this lesson. Summarize what God says happens to us when we experience the love of God by believing in Jesus Christ. So what, what changes in us? everything at least everything should <laughs> yeah yeah but but loving has to do with people and relationships yeah i know the little children in a in our awana club used to you know think it was weird i told them i, I didn't like children <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was abundantly obvious that that was not the truth anymore. But uh, the truth is, is that in my own natural state, I really didn't like kids very much. They were pests. But God changes your heart. And he gives you love towards uh, children and young people. God gives you love towards the elderly and the people who are struggling. God even gives you love for your enemies and those who are persecuting you and making your life miserable. And the greatest love that we see from God is that he sent Jesus Christ to reconcile us, to be the propitiation. And we want everyone to know, even our enemies. We would never were, wish uh, God's wrath upon our worst enemies because we know that what that means, <laughs> God's wrath. Um, 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 5 tells us, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Take time now to do that. It would be the worst mistake of your life to think you're a Christian if you are not. So ask yourself whether you are a true Christian and how you know it. What's the evidence? I just welcome everyone who's watching this to pause the tape. Pause the video and, and just think about that. How do you know you are a true Christian? What's the evidence of it? according to what we have learned today. All right, I'm going to go to the wrap-up session here, and I'm just going to change scenes. Hope it works out. Hey, it worked out. Very good. All right. How great a love the Father has bestowed on us, 
that we would be called children of God, and such we are. That's what it says in 1 John 3, verse 1. O oh, beloved of God, stop and think about what you've learned about the love of God this week. Go back through the words of God you've just studied. Meditate on them. Let them fill your mind, saturate your heart. Go deep into your soul, your inner man. You are loved unconditionally, eternally, with an everlasting love. He calls you beloved when there was nothing lovely about you. Once you come to God acknowledging your sin, your impotence to save yourself, your need of a Savior, His love will be poured out in your heart through the Spirit of God who He gives to you. Once you truly believe, once you truly receive Jesus, nothing, absolutely nothing will ever be able to separate you from His everlasting love. You're a member of God's family forever his forever family. Let this truth go deep into your soul until it's absorbed by every fiber of your being. God holds you in his hand. No one can take you out of his hand. Everything that comes into your life will be filtered through his sovereign fingers of love. Think about it, beloved. Isn't that reassuring? As his child, Nothing that happens in your life will ever be more than you can bear. This is your spiritual birthright. The more secure you become in his love, the more you will find yourself freely loving others with the love of God, even your enemies. And by this, others will know that you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If you have the time, it would be so good to worship God, thanking him for his great love with which he has loved you. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, it's overwhelming to know how much you love us and how great the sacrifice was to send your son, your only son, your beloved son, to die in our place that we could be reconciled to you. We hardly understand this kind of self-sacrificial love. And so, Father God, I just pray that you would pour out your love and your heart on the people who are listening, who have been following in this study, that you would draw them to yourself and that you would bring them to repentance and cause them to be saved and to know your peace, O Prince of Peace, and to know the inutterable security that nothing can separate us from the love of God in, which is in Christ Jesus. I pray that you bless each one with an outpouring of your great and marvelous goodness to us. Thank you, Father, for doing this for us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place. Amen. Amen.